Looks like we've had several others join us. We've got now about 26 folks with us on the call here. Uh, my name is Katie Hawk. I will be your host today for the Nature Connects Us webinar series. We're really excited about today's programming. Uh, we get to feature one of our, our spectacular friends whom I hope you have all had an opportunity to meet. Not only is he incredibly knowledgeable, he's been with TNC, I think since the day he was born. And, <laughs> and he's also incredibly entertaining. So this is definitely uh, one of the shows you don't want to miss. Um, our very own Bison Bob Hamilton from the, jo John, from the Joseph H. Williams Tall Grass Prairie Preserve in Pahuska is joining us today. And he's going to talk with us about bison burns and butterflies. This is a really big topic. There's a lot of science, a lot of research, a lot of information, and Bob has ample years of experience under his belt with this topic. So it is, uh, we, he is going to do his best to squeeze this into 15 minutes. Um, however, we want to make sure we preserve a great amount of time for everyone to ask their questions. That's the most exciting part of this. So, you know, jot, jot your questions down as we go. As we near the end of his talk um, and we break from it, you will see, you can see it now, but that will be your opportunity to send us questions. You can send us questions during the, the, the presentation. However, he will not be answering them until the Q&A session. So if you want to go ahead and type them in, that's fine. You have two ways to submit questions. Down at the bottom, there's a button that says Q&A and or you can utilize that handy chat window that you've already opened up to answer the name that sound game. All right, so Bob, welcome. We're going to turn this over to you and um, excited to hear from you. So take it away. Thanks, Katie. It's, it's, uh, this is a nice function to have on a nice rainy day while we're all hiding out in our bunkers, right? So uh, we're gonna we're gonna think and talk about how the Nature Conservancy is uh, is trying to restore the Tallgrass Prairie ecosystem at our Joseph H. Williams Tallgrass Prairie Preserve. Uh, hopefully, all you folks or the majority of you folks have been up to our little piece of heaven up in Osage County, uh, straight north of Pahuska, and uh, it's an evolving experiment as I think of it. So uh, some fairly groundbreaking work that we're trying to do and and putting Humpty back together essentially. And, uh, and restoring a tall grass, uh, functional tall grass prairie ecosystem to benefit biological diversity. So let's roll it. Katie? So you're all familiar, you've all got this tattooed somewhere on your body, I, I, hope, I hope so, or assume. But the mission of the Nature Conservancy is to conserve lands and waters on which all life depends. So I boil it down to, uh, in terms of the conservation end of it, how we, we think about on the ground action, it's all about biological diversity. Uh, we want all these native plants and animals and the ecosystems in which they reside, uh, we want them to all come along for the ride. So uh, we're trying to preserve uh, long-term habitat stability for all these species and systems. So, next slide. And we are science-driven. So um, the concept of heterogeneity, this is the, uh, the $5 word, right? So if you, if you drop this in a conversation here in the near future, oh, people will think you are a scientist. So, uh, so you know, jot this thing down, but, but heterogeneity, simply put, is just variability or uh, diversity out there. It's, it's talked about in, in conservation sciences circles as, you know, the variability of, of habitat types. Uh, all different habitats, all different ecosystems have their inherent heterogeneity whether you're talking about marine ocean systems, uh, freshwater aquatic systems, terrestrial systems, all ecosystems have a natural disturbance and recovery component to them. And the resulting habitats that, are, that come from that natural disturbance, that's what provides the habitat for, for native plants and animals. Those are, the, those are the forces of nature that created these habitats in the first place and have maintained biological diversity for eons. So, as we think about how we're trying to manage our lands, we have to pay close attention to how they originally used to function uh, in terms of that natural disturbance regime. And you'll see down at the very bottom that, that um, uh, last little bullet, I'll touch on that again later on, but uh, increasingly the idea or this concept of heterogeneity is getting attention in terms of climate change. How do we make the landscape more uh, change friendly for species as we deal with climate change? Next slide, please. 
So grassland birds are a great uh, example of the need for heterogeneity. Grasslands birds speak or they call for the need for heterogeneity. Uh, if you can click on the first one there. So you'll see across the bottom it, that represents uh, what we're trying to, to convey here is, is different habitat types, different degrees of uh, recovery from disturbance. So on the far left is a habitat or a patch that's been recently burned and is getting intensively grazed, has very little residual vegetation. On the far right, you'll see uh, that number 36 represents, you know, roughly 36 months since that disturbance. So on the far right would be patches on the landscape that have tremendous amounts of litter or dead grass in them, plus living uh, vegetation, of course, but it's getting very rank, very thick. So grassland birds, uh, for the most part, don't really care too much about the composition of the prairie. They don't really care a whole lot about what species they're nesting in. What they care about is the structure, the habitat type, you know, the, the, the nesting material. So we have some species, dick thistles, meadowlarks, grasshopper sparrows, that are fairly elastic uh, in terms of their habitat needs. Dick thistles are our most abundant grassland bird, and you can see they use all those different patch types. Then at the other end of the scale, uh, next slide, the next click, you'll see Henslow sparrows. I think of Henslows as kind of our old growth species. When they migrate back from Central, from South America in the springtime, the, the, the imagery they have in, burned into their brain in terms of the, the nesting habitat they're looking for is patches on the landscape that have several years of standing dead grass. You won't find them nesting at the other end of the scale, if you'll click on that, Katie where we do have species like upland sandpipers and killdeers, you know, you, a lot of people know killdeers, you know, they'll nest in a parking lot uh, in the gravel, you know, their, their eggs are, are well camouflaged for that sort of environment. But likewise, you will not find Henslow sparrows nesting in freshly burned habitat. You will never find killdeers nesting in those old growth habitats. So if we want the complete array of, of grassland nesting birds, our native species out there, at any moment in time during the, the breeding season, we have to provide, as a land manager, you have to provide all these different patch types. Wow, that's a challenge, right? How do we do that? So next slide. Well, again, and in, in how we, we think about our, our land management responsibilities, the, the first step is, is looking back, uh, becoming familiar with how those landscapes used to function, how those ecosystems used to function, what were the primary drivers historically? And so in the Great Plains of North America, we think about the big three, uh, the big three ecological drivers being climate, grazing, and fire. Those are the, the overriding influences in nature that created the Great Plains and maintained it for eons. And increasingly, you'll see in the bottom left corner in the, the red text, the historic linkage between grazing and fire is getting increasingly acknowledged in conservation uh, biology circles and grassland ecology circles over the last several decades, uh, it's, it's getting more attention or more recognition as a global phenomenon. Wherever you have grazers and fire in combination in these landscapes, there's this resulting heterogeneity. There's this, there's this real tight linkage between those two forces. There's even been the argument made that scientifically, it's improper to, to research, to think about grazing and fire being separate ecological forces. No. They, they historically worked together, they were historically tightly linked, and you really can't pull those two apart. Grazing and fire, it's a, it's a yin-yang sort of thing. So, next slide. Oh. So we, uh, in terms of how we're trying to put Humpty back together at the Tallgrass Preserve, uh, we got into the bison business back in the fall of 1993. I uh, had a, a neat little ceremony where we introduced our 300 animal starter herd on 5,000 acres on kind of the west side of the property. Took about 15 years to build up to our, our stable herd size and now we over or we typically have about 2,200 bison uh, on the preserve now uh, that the, the size of the unit grew through the years over that first 15 years and now it's about 24,400 acres. So our, our bison have about 38 square miles. <clears throat> they go where they want to go within that landscape as long as they don't leave the place they got to stay home. Uh, but as long as they don't leave the place, uh, they determine where they want to go. And so it's, uh, we are going just the opposite trend of most of um, domestic livestock management. The trend, uh, especially over the last 50 years or so, has been smaller and smaller management units, tighter and tighter control of the movement of your animals. We're going in the opposite direction. We pulled out about 60 miles of internal fence 
to create this one big pasture. The bison go where they want to go. Next slide, please. Fire is, of course, the other big part of, of how we're, we're putting this, this system back together. The big picture globally, uh, really the, the title to this slide should be Tierra del Fuego. We live on the fire planet. Most of our system, most of our ecosystem types, our habitat types, everything you see painted green on this map, from a conservation perspective, uh, those habitat types are considered to be fire dependent. Fire was part of their evolutionary history. Fire is extremely important in maintaining those habitat types for biological diversity. Where you see red painted on this map is where at least the way fire is happening now, it's considered to be a negative influence on biological diversity. Uh, you'll see what's happening in the Amazon basin down in South America, uh, slash and burn agriculture, uh, you know, converting those, those tropical systems uh, into agriculture. So uh, yellow on this map are systems where fire really doesn't play a role. Uh, you'll see the sub sub saharan area in Africa, and, you know, sand doesn't burn too well. So, uh, but anyway, my point is look at North America, the vast majority of North America is considered to be fire dependent. Next slide. So at, at the Tallgrass Preserve, this is a depiction for four years. Uh, you're looking at kind of the patch mosaic or the, the, the patch movement through time uh, over four calendar years of our burn program. So within the bison unit, we're putting fire back into the landscape in ways that approximates the original fire disturbance regime uh, in terms of its seasonality. So what you're seeing is green or summer or spring patches, red or summer burns, blue or, or fall or winter burns. And then we're putting fire back in there in ways that approximate the original fire frequency. So we're on roughly a three year fire return interval. So of the, the roughly 24,000 acres, that means about 8,000 acres gets burned a year divided between those different seasons. The patches are randomly selected. We have no fixed burn units. The idea, I think of it as kind of this elegant chaos, managed chaos. I, I need to work on the marketing into that. One. But, but the idea is we're trying to get back to a messy landscape, providing this patchiness, this shifting landscape patch mosaic, throwing fire and grazers back together, and let's see what happens in terms of the resulting heterogeneity out there on the landscape. Next slide. And it's, this is easy peasy stuff. Um, when it comes to grazers, uh, you know, burn it and they will come. I mean, that high quality forage, if you're a grazer and you're making your living on, on vegetation out on the landscape, you want every bite to be a good bite. You want high quality, you want high digestibility. Whether you're a bison, whether you're a cow, whether you're a giraffe, whether you're, whether you're a kangaroo, uh, all these different species around the world, even hippos have been shown to respond to, fire, to forage quality enhancement from fire. If you wanna increase your grazing of hippos, burn a patch and they will waddle in that direction, I guess. Uh, this also applies to things like grasshoppers. They are a grazer. If you want to find the highest density of grasshoppers, go to a fresh burn patch, burn it and they will come. So it, the fire grazing interaction is, is this strong interaction. It's, it's, it's just, uh, it's an easy thing for, for herbivores to see. Yeah. So we're using strategically, we're trying to reconstitute, uh, uh, rejoin fire and grazing uh, in this uh, kind of evolving experiment as I still think of it. Uh, really using this fire induced rotational uh, effect to move bison across their unit. Uh, you have to think of it in a multi-year rotational grazing sort of perspective, uh, but we're using fire rather than fences to move animals around through the years, through the seasons, knowing that they will be highly attracted to these fresh burn patches, particularly during the growing season, as you might expect. You know, if you're a grazing animal, what would you rather be grazing? This nice lush green grass in the foreground that has 15 to 20% protein, highly digestible, or that white grass you see way back here in the background, uh, that of course the white patches in the background, that's that the standing dead grass, several years post fire, a lot of thatch, a lot of dead grass in there. That's tough to make a living if you're a grazer, that's one to 2% protein. You know, you might as well eat number two pencils, about the same thing, uh, very low digestibility. But if you're a Henslow Sparrow, ooh, that's where you want to make your living. So the idea, again, is 
using this fire grazing interaction to restore this heterogeneity or this variability on the landscape to support biological diversity. Next slide. So really the prairie goes through this, and again, this is natural disturbance, disturbance recovery cycle. I think of it as kind of exercising the prairie. So you burn a patch, it gets intensive herbivory, um, especially summer fires, what you're looking at here is the first growing season after a, a growing season burn. That really re-scrambles the plant community. But the taller plants you'll see in the middle, you can see some blue, big blue stem that's pushing up there. Mostly what's catching your eye is annual broomweed, which is a native species that comes in with natural disturbance. It, it flushes into the system. It has a tremendous seed source out there in the prairie all the time, just waiting for an opportunity. Uh, but I don't consider broomweed to be a weed. It's a native forb. That its ecological role is to fill in when there's been a disturbance like this. Next slide. But then once you get several years post-fire, and again, we're always creating new burns on the landscape. The bison are drawn to those new patches. And so there's several years of, of recovery that's built into the system after that, that initial uh, grazing fire event. So once you get several growing seasons post-fire, uh, the prairie's been rested, uh, those dominant warm season grasses and those, those later sectional forbs come back in. And so we, again, we're, we're providing all these different patch types, all these different disturbance recovery opportunities out there for the prairie. Next slide. So kind of the big, big picture is uh, this fire grazing interaction is, is kind of the guiding philosophy uh, to create landscape diversity or heterogeneity out there on the landscape, which we know supports biological diversity. Uh, we're, Katie mentioned uh, we've had a lot of ecological research done on the preserve. We're somewhere around 200 scientific publications uh, right now that have come out in peer reviewed journals. Everything is saying this is working extremely well. So creating this patchy landscape, shifting landscape patch mosaic sort of landscape is working real well to meet our, our organizational goals of preserving biological diversity. So this is working real well for us today. And like I mentioned, increasingly uh, this sort of approach in all different ecosystems is being talked about as a climate change adaptability approach that, hey, let's, let's create a lot of opportunities out there in the landscape we're not quite sure which, which way these systems are going to go in the future, but let's create a lot of opportunities. Let's maintain heterogeneity or diversity out there. Let the species figure it out. Give them opportunities to, to move across the landscape and, and shift as, as they see fit. Next slide. I think that's it. That's the soft form fuzzy right there. I love your ending with a soft form fuzzy. That's fantastic, well, yeah. Bob. Thank you, you so much. You just want to give That's... them a hug, don't you? <laughs> and a kiss. Yeah, yeah, a hug and a kiss. Yeah. Those, yeah. That sweet little nose. Oh. Yeah. yeah, watch out for mom, though. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, that was wonderful. Thank you so very much, Bob, for sharing that information with us. Right quick, yeah. I'm going to stop this share here so we can all see Bob. Um, mm -hmm. Please everyone, now is the time for the Q&A session with Bob, Bison Bob, Butterfly Bob, Burn Bob. Uh, if you would please find the Q&A button or the chat button at the, at the bottom of your window and begin to send us your questions in. Bob, I'm gonna kick start us off with a question of my own for you. Um, yep. And that is, I'm, I'm eager to learn a little bit more about which particular, are there any particular pollinator friendly plants that really excel from burns? You know, what about milkweed? Or could you talk to us a little bit about some specific pollinator friendly plants? Yeah, I mean, I would say we've got a number of, of different uh, native milkweed species. You know, overall for the preserved plant community, we've identified about a little over 760 vascular plant species. So about twice as what, twice the number that we actually expected. Uh, so that's a nice pleasant surprise that we still have a very diverse uh, plant community out there. In, in terms of, I, let me go down a little bit of a rabbit hole here, but um, on many sites, you know, you especially get up in the Midwestern part of the country uh, to the north and northeast of us, uh, where, the, where the tall grass preserve uh, ecosystem in particular has have seen drastic changes. You know, this Flint Hills landscape, we call it the Osage Hills in Oklahoma, of course, but this roughly four to five million acres that the preserve is embedded within is the last big, the last landscape level example of tall grass prairie. The other 96% is gone, it's all been plowed. 
and of course is the, the breadbasket of North America now. So you get up into those into those parts of the prairie where the vast majority of it has been converted. Uh, there's been a lot of work by the Nature Conservancy and other conservation groups to try to restore or reconstruct prairie, to take soybean fields and wheat fields and corn fields and plant them back to prairie. Ooh, man, that's that's hard work. That's expensive. God, I'm too lazy for that. So <laughs> we're, we're so fortunate here. We're so blessed that we still have this native plant community that's intact. Uh, you know, none of the prairie on the, on the preserve has been plowed historically, so it's still intact native prairie. And so we're blessed with this abundant plant community. We still have the original players. All we have to do, you know, I mean, it's easy stuff. All we have to do in terms of prairie restoration is restore the dynamics, restore the, the, the graz, grazing fire interaction. So uh, we get to do the fun part. We don't have to do the, all that hard stuff. And so anyway, to your question, uh, yeah, we have a whole lot of uh, native milkweeds out there. I'd say green antelope horn is our predominant um, milkweed out there in the landscape that, uh, that's really important for native pollinators. And what we find, it's interesting, there's been a little bit of work done with um, off-season burns, as, you, as some people call them. The vast majority of you know, how fire has been used historically uh, over the last century or so has been with, with spring burns in March and April, uh, trying to time those fires right as the prairie is coming back to life in springtime. Um, that's the, typically kind of as, as a range management tool, the timing that's been used and for conservationists. But we've, like I said, we've been using fire. We know historically the fire used to burn all through the year, spring, summer, fall. Uh, native peoples were setting fires at all different seasons. Uh, lightning strikes were happening, of course, primarily during the growing season, but the prairie was burning year round. And so uh, again, that's, that's the system that, that the species were adapted to. And so that's the way we're trying to put Humpty back together is throwing fire back out there in all different seasons. And interesting, what we've found is, especially those growing season burns, um, kind of late summer burns in August and September, on a lot of our forbs, on a lot of our native wildflowers, it resets the clock. And so uh, green antelope horn milkweed is, is growing vigorously right now as a lot of other forbs are. Uh, but once you get into late summer, a lot of the native forbs start shutting down. They've, they're kind of past their prime. They've bloomed. Uh, it's getting hot. It's getting dry. They're starting to shut down. And they, they kind of go into a torpor sort of thing. Uh, but when you burn in, in, in August and September, if you have adequate soil moisture, boom, it, it, it recharges those guys. They jump back up. They, they re-sprout. And, and if there's enough time left in the growing season, they'll actually reflower. And so it provides a, a kind of a secondary source uh, uh, for some of our native pollinator species that's, that's thought to be pretty important, uh, especially like monarchs moving, uh, moving south during the fall migration. So uh, kind of an interesting little twist there on the, the fire puzzle. Yeah, I bet. So definitely if you're having mm -hmm. to incorporate all the natural events into your, your fire planning as well. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. thanks for sharing. Yeah. And we have a question here from Rochelle. Uh, she is asking what lessons from the Tallgrass Prairie Preserve could be shared with the Forestry Service in the West to prevent the horrible fires in that area? Yeah, that, that's a good point. Um, we have vastly different systems, of course, uh, with, with uh, some of those Western ecosystems. Um, but I think what we've learned, and there's been a little bit of work done in this part of the country, uh, some of our research friends at Oklahoma State University have looked at this that by having one of the arguments for heterogeneity, one of the arguments for managing for a patchier landscape, um, not burning everything in the same year, uh, by break, breaking that apart into different seasons and different years, kind of a more of a kaleidoscope. Uh, I think of it as kind of a crazy quilt sort of look out there. Um, by managing in that direction, uh, when you do have wildfire events, uh, your previous burns act as fire breaks. And so, uh, and we've had a number of, we've had over 100 wildfires on the preserve through the years. And that's what we've seen too, is any, even in those real extreme situations where you get 50, 60 mile an hour winds and here she comes, <laughs> it's a little scary. Uh, but uh, by having some previous burn patches out there and uh, reduced fuels essentially on the landscape, those give you something to work off of in terms of wildfire management or control. And so uh, I think that's a lesson and, and I, I'm not real familiar with what's going on in terms of those Western fire ecologies, but I, I do, uh, from some of the conferences and stuff, I do hear people talking about this idea of, 
of kind of fuel heterogeneity uh, might be an approach to, to deal with uh, some of those big Western fires or those big Western landscapes. You know, let's break it apart and, and, and get some variability out there on the landscape so that it all just doesn't go poof all at the same time. Very good. Okay. Thank you for answering that. And I know I do know, and Rochelle, just a, a little FYI, um, you're welcome to go to nature.org and even look at individual states in the West area and learn more about their burn programs. There are a number of TNC chapters out West that are that do have prescribed fire uh, programs uh, going on. I, specifically, I do know New Mexico and Colorado have some uh, pr controlled fires uh, specifically to address water quality along specific watersheds as well. So um, there might be some more information there on nature.org. Uh, and then and also if there's any particular places out west you're curious about, let us know and we can uh, look up in our system and see what projects that we have out in that area or um, other partners that may have some pres prescribed burn projects in that area as well. So thank you for the question, Rochelle. All right, let's see. I've got a couple other questions here for you. Let me, uh, let's see. While we're on the topic of burns, right quick, Larry Hall is asking, he says, it was reported that around 10,000 acres were burned on uh, at Tallgrass Prairie. Hang on, things are moving on me. At Tallgrass Prairie this spring. That exceeds the normal formula where we do a third of the prairie per year and 30% in dormant spring. Is there a reason for this large amount to be burned this spring? Well, that, yeah, that acreage was for the overall preserve. So remember the bison unit is only about 24,000 acres of the 40,000 acre preserve. So the, the overall property is about 40,000 acres. Um, and I didn't mention because of time, but hey, maybe I got some time. Yeah. Uh, uh, we have about 11,000 acres of the preserve dedicated to uh, kind of a conservation research uh, outreach. I think almost like an experiment station uh, sort of approach. We never thought, well, look, to back up a little further, our, our conservation objective uh, for the project, for the Tallgrass project, is beyond the Tallgrass. If 50 or 100 years from now, if all that's left is our little 40,000 acres and the other 4 million acres of the Flint Hills somehow is lost, uh, we will not have achieved our, our conservation objective and we will lose species like greater prairie chickens that require a much bigger space than, than we can provide just on our little piece of the prairie. So our conservation objective is maintaining the intactness, uh, that last vestige of, of tall grass prairie that, that the Flint Hills and the Osage Hills represent. We never thought, um, as we got into the whole fire bison uh, program and, and kind of trying to, to restart that ecosystem, uh, create that example of a functional system, we never thought uh, that's gonna be real transportable or, or exportable to the private ranching industry. Uh, we, we pride ourselves on trying to be practical conservationists. Um, we are science driven, but we are also realists. And so um, most, you know, we just, recognize most ranchers are not gonna to switch to bison. Uh, most ranchers, even if they do, they're probably not gonna be burning spring, summer, and fall, random selection, oh my God. You know, it's just, it's this, yeah. It, it's a pretty intense effort to try to restore, to try to maintain the prairie in ways that just used to happen, you know, on a much larger scale for free. <laughs> now we have to do it as land managers. Thank goodness that gives me a job, you know, uh, but, but we never thought uh, it was gonna be real exportable. And so um, back uh, starting in 2001, we, we started a partnership with Oklahoma State University. Uh, OSU has been our primary ecological research partner. And so uh, the idea was what, what have we learned from this fire bison interaction thing? You know, how well is this working in terms of meeting our conservation goals in terms of biodiversity? Uh, how can we take some of those lessons learned and apply that to domestic livestock? How can we make grazing, cattle grazing, more conservation friendly? And so the, the term patch burn grazing was coined. And so since 2001, we, we've dedicated, we got, like I said, we have about 11,000 acres of the preserve that is dedicated to patch burn grazing with cattle. And so uh, we have different treatments. We're actually on our third go round, our third iteration of experiments uh, or treatments out there. And so we're looking at different seasons of fire, uh, different intervals of fire uh, with domestic livestock in a patch burn grazing approach. Uh, think of it as, you know, 
rather than typically burning the complete pasture, whether you're, and our pastures are usually one to 2,000 acres in there, uh, rather than burning the complete pasture, you only burn a third of it or a fourth of it that year, and then you burn another third, another fourth the next year. So again, think of it as a multi-year rotational type system. And what we're trying to do is, is research that approach. Uh, and what we're finding is very, some very positive um, results from that thing that we can manage domestic livestock in a much more creative way. At the same time, we're gathering all the cattle production information. We weigh them all coming in and co going out. Because uh, the first thing a rancher is going to ask you is, well, you know, how, are my, how are my animals going to perform under this system? And so what we found is patch burn grazing, basically burning in this multiple year rotational type system, has no statistical impact at all on your cattle gains. But ooh, if you are interested in things like grassland nesting birds and prairie chickens, this is the deal for you. You know, this, this will really diversify your ranch. Uh, you can really up the wildlife component on your property and the, the plant diversity out there and really with, with no cost to your pocketbook in terms of your cattle production. So uh, long story short, uh, we've, we've dedicated and we'll probably continue to de dedicate a pretty good portion of the preserve. We're increasingly trying to use our properties as kind of, uh, like I say, conservation export sites. You know, let's, um, let's dig into some of these issues. Uh, what are some of the bigger issues surrounding us in, this, in the rest of the landscape? How can we speak to some of those conservation issues uh, using our properties, using our land base. And so we're very excited about that. And so we're seeing that idea exported beyond the preserve. So we're getting some, some traction with that. So we're really excited about that. Fantastic. Thank you for, for explaining that in further depth, Bob. Appreciate yeah, it. Yeah. Um, we've got, got to cut a, me off. <laughs> <laughs> no way. No way. So on uh, speaking of the grazing and cattle grazing, Amy has a question regarding the local beef industry. Have we heard anything from the local beef industry? Is the preserve and or neighboring ranchers changing plans for grazing at all to compensate? I haven't heard much about that. I mean, it's, it, it is unsettling times for a lot of industries, a lot of parts of our economy out there. Um, we're, we're seeing, I mean, with, even with the bison industry, these are unsettling times. Uh, there is a... Uh, uh, private bison ranching type industry, if you want to call it that. That's where our surplus animals that we pull off the preserve each year to maintain our appropriate stocking rate, uh, we sell those into the private ranching industry. And so there's a lot of the same uh, concerns out there. You know, and if you're in the feedlot business, there's a lot of concern about, uh, you know, uh, prices on, on feed grains. There's a lot of uh, worry about, you know, Thinking if you put animals in the feedlot, you've got some, you, you have to have some faith that you're going to have a market for those animals when they're done, when they're ready. You can't keep them in the feedlot forever. That, that does not work out too well. Um, but there's all sorts of impacts. I mean, I'm even hearing, you know, with distiller grains. So the ethanol industry has been impacted because of the, the, the downward trend and, and uh, in gasoline usage. And of course, you know, we have a mandate nationally to put so much ethanol in gasoline. And, uh, that's produced by, by uh, grains. And so the, but the product coming out the other end, the, the, the byproduct from the, distill, from the distillation process, they call it distiller's grains, is quite popular in, for feeding or finishing either bison or cattle in the feedlot. And so that, that part of the industry has been disrupted. So uh, it will be interesting to see, I mean, back to your question, um, I have not seen any tweaks come along, but um, you may see some, some shifts in terms of how long uh, animals, you know, for the most part, the domestic livestock in our neighborhood are short season cattle, uh, short season steers. They come on in mid-April, they leave mid-July, if they're really on, only on the prairie for about 90 or 100 days, typically then they go straight to the feedlot. They, they get fed grain for 60 or 90 days, and then they go to McDonald's. Um, so very short, compressed sort of production system. Uh, we may see changes where maybe people run their cattle a little bit longer, uh, keep them out on grass longer, um, depending on the prices. A lot of, most of the time, grass is cheaper uh, in terms of putting weight on your animals than, than grain is. So we'll see how things shift around. Interesting. Well, it sounds like you just answered another question from Amy in <laughs> to keeping the cows on the land for longer. So that's good. Um, also, uh, 
Let's see, I really only know of one other question here and I was saving it for last because we have a few other talking points specific to it. But Bob White says, hey man, I got skunked when I went to the preserve recently. No, he didn't phrase it just like that, but he says, you know, hey, he went to tall grass on Sunday and he got skunked on bison. So uh, he on wants, bison. yeah, he wants to know where are they hiding on a really pretty nice day? That's a good question. It is amazing how they can uh, disappear out there. Um, but remember, it's it's their their unit is a little over twenty four thousand acres. So uh, it is amazing how they can disappear. And we have about twenty miles of public county road that that run through different parts of their unit. It's it's an open range type situation. Uh, typically, there'll be some animals fairly close to the road, or you know, you get a pretty good look at them. Um, but some days, it's like, wow, where are those little rascals? And uh, and it'll even get a little spooky sometimes, where it's like. Hmm. Maybe we should call around to the neighbors and see if, you know, <laughs> has anybody seen a couple thousand bison? Um, but but our, our ranch hands are prowling around, you know, keeping an eye on them all the time, especially in terms of animal health issues. Um, typically, they are not a, that much of a problem to keep on the preserve. We, we actually have more of a challenge with the steers, with the cattle that we bring in for our patch burn grazing research. Uh, they are more of a containment problem than the, than the bison are. You know, the steers are just squirrely when they, you know, they're brought in from Texas or Florida or wherever. They spend the first three or four days just walking the fence. So they, they will let you know where you have a hole in the fence or a problem. Whereas the bison seem to be fairly content on where they are. Um, but yeah, it is amazing how the bison can disappear. I would say seasonally, it makes a difference. If you want the highest probability of seeing bison, of getting close to bison, come out in the winter time. Uh, they go through, all bison respond the same way in a, where they have a lot of space and they're on a native uh, rangeland type situation and they have free association with each other. Um, they'll go through a seasonal shift in how they wanna associate with each other. So in the winter time is when whole groups are broken off separately they're, you know, half a dozen or a dozen old guys hanging together or even ones and twos. And they don't want to be around mom and the kids. Uh, they're, they're just hanging out, drinking beer and watching football. <laughs> I don't know what they're doing out there. <laughs> but they, they just want to have some guy time, you know. Uh, and then you'll have the, the mixed groups that are together. But typically at that time of the year, the average group size for the female driven or the kind of the female component is only several dozen. And so... If you have several thousand bison out there and their average group size is 20 to 30, that means there's a whole lot of different groups out there. They're all pinging and ponging around, all moving in their own little directions. If you were to watch it from space, I'm sure it, it would look like, you know, crazy little ping pong balls moving around. Group A, group B, uh, all that kind of stuff. So your, your odds of seeing a group or coming close to a group is higher in the wintertime. Once we get into springtime, like right now, as the calves start coming, those females that have had calves will start associating with each other. So you get kind of calf groups built up and you'll start seeing, especially when we get into midsummer, uh, you'll see these groups of, you know, 40 and 50 calves all out there just, you know, looking for trouble, uh, hanging out with these, these uh, uh, kind of cow groups. As we get into the breeding season, so July and August, when it gets hot and sticky and nasty on the prairie, that's when love is in the air. And so in July and August, uh, that's when the bulls come back in. Uh, you know, they're all in one big pasture. Again, it's, it's not like domestic livestock where you pull the bulls out and you only put the bulls in when you want breeding done. Our bulls are out there year round with everybody else. And what determines when those females will, will breed is their, their kind of their, their personal cycling really through the year. And so as any wild animal, uh, in the temperate zone, uh, winter is the crunch time. If you can survive winter, you know, summer's easy peasy. So winter time is a crunch time. They're, they're going through their fat reserves. Uh, there's very little stress on those animals, especially those cows that are still nursing a calf. They don't have the physiological wherewithal to cycle, to breed during the off season, during the winter time. As you get in the spring and their body condition starts recovering, by late summer, uh, those females will be in body condition up to the body condition where they can they can breed again. So the bulls pull back in. In in July and August, it's kind of a hit or miss. So uh, if you come to the preserve in the heat of the summer, you may well end up in the middle of a group of a thousand, uh, a big breeding group. The bulls are bellowing, 
roaring at each other and pawing. Uh, it is really cool stuff. I just like to close my eyes because it's like you're on the Serengeti. It sounds like lions on the prairie, just that bellowing and roaring. And at night, it will make the hair stand up on the back of your head. It's like, oh, something's going to eat me. Uh, but uh, in the summertime, that's what's so cool is, and I think that July, August period is a really neat time because there's all that activity going on. But again, you're going you're gonna to see a group of a thousand or you're not going to see anybody because they're just a couple miles over on the other side of the hill. So, so I guess my point is through the seasons, as the seasons change, it will change how the bison associate with each other, the group sizes. And so that, therefore that kind of impacts your, your probability of seeing animals. But sorry you got skunked the other day, but come back again. <laughs> Thank goodness admission is free, right? <laughs> there you go. There you go. Yeah. It's, it's part of the thrill, right? It's not, uh, not to denigrate zoos, but um, it's not a sure thing. Uh, we're trying to manage them as a wild species. We're trying to respect their wildness as much as possible. That means giving them a lot of space, handling them at a very minimum, um, and kind of a tough love program as I think of it. There's some grass, there's probably some water down there in that creek. Uh, stay home, good luck, see ya. You know, do your job. Uh, so we, we try to manage them in an unfettered sort of way. Fantastic. Well, I remember at one time you mentioned it to me in the, in the uh, using the words, something along the lines of, uh, they, they survive on the grass that grows and the water that flows. There you go. There you and go. I was like, that's a great management plan. Sounds awesome. <laughs> it's a great system. Minimal inputs, you know. Wow. Who thought this up? Ooh, Absolutely. You know? um, but uh, pretty cool. Um, yeah, as long as they've got some forage and some water, they are fine. And that's, that's again, the way we try to manage them. We do not supplement them. Um, we don't give them any protein energy supplement through the wintertime. Of course, you know, with domestic livestock, uh, especially in, in most grassland types, uh, you have to supplement those animals, especially if you're in a, in a cow-calf operation, if you want to keep uh, those females in good body condition to where they can develop a fetus through the wintertime, uh, you better give her some supplementation. You know, they, they need at least 10, 12%, somewhere in their protein in their diet, whereas in the wintertime, again, that, that standing dead grass that's all been frozen down on the prairie, uh, you're talking one to two percent protein. So pretty difficult to keep a domestic cow in good body condition without supplement through the winter time or steers if you're trying to put some weight on them. Uh, our bison though, we figure they've had a long time to figure this out. Uh, we know from there's been a number of studies that have compared bison and cattle. There's all sorts of different bison cattle stuff out there in the, in the literature, but uh, there's several studies comparing bison and cattle in terms of uh, forage quality. And in a feedlot situation, cattle will always outperform bison. Uh, you're feeding them the same, if you're feeding, feeding both of them corn, cattle can just put on weight much faster than bison. But then again, we as humans, we've been fussing and tweaking domestic livestock for several thousand years to perform that way. Uh, on the other hand, on low quality forages, like standing dead grass in the winter time under tough conditions, under tough love conditions, bison can extract much more nutritional value and energy from that, that dormant, that low quality vegetation than domestic livestock. They've had a much longer period of time to figure that out in terms of their evolutionary history. So uh, we're, we're, go we're going with that. We're going with the long-term gain. Fantastic. Well, we don't have any more questions, Bob. However, I would like to ask you one, if you could close this out just by sharing with our viewers um, a little bit about how the research, specifically uh, the, 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 this uh, fire burn grazing interaction, but also overall in general, just a quick brief um, information to us about how the research at Tallgrass influences practices around the world um, and how you all disseminate that information gets out and how we're able to um, help improve practices beyond our borders at the, at the preserve. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we've taken a pretty active, or I guess we've taken a very deliberate approach um, through the years, you know, recognizing that uh, we were creating this one-of-a-kind research opportunity uh, if you're a grassland ecologist and you want to study the tall grass prairie ecosystem, uh, what we have going here is the largest, most aggressive 
uh, what my daughter used to say, the bestest, the, the biggest and the bestest example of tall grass prairie in the world. And so, uh, if you're interested in, in scientific questions surrounding that uh, that ecosystem, uh, the tall grass prairie preserve is the place to come. I mean, this is this is the top of the mountain, although we don't really have a mountain, but but um, it's it's the best place to do that. And so we get a lot of our ecological research, like I mentioned, about 200 scientific publications through the years. Uh, the vast majority of that has been looking at uh, different dynamics of how this ecosystem works from uh, fungi in the soil and below ground uh, dynamics of what's going on. And that, that's kind of a whole new universe, you know, what's going on underground in terms of the, both the, the biological aspects of it and the chemistry of it, uh, carbon sequestration, all those kind of things. Uh, the underground stuff is is uh, kind of the, the new frontier, really. Uh, but but the above ground stuff as a land manager, and I'm kind of an above ground guy. That's what I think about anyway. Um, how am I managing the, uh, to provide all these different habitat opportunities out there for different species? And so it it's a uh, it's an interesting business. But we we made a deliberate, I guess, decision back years ago that uh, yeah, we're going to create this very interesting uh, template out there. This very interesting environment that science is gonna be interested in, uh, rather than us trying to do the science ourselves, let's try to form partnerships because the way, um, the way you get scientific information out there uh, in terms of the, the mechanism, the, the recognized path uh, to share information is through peer-reviewed literature, uh, peer-reviewed publications. And so <clears throat> that's where, as I mentioned, we, we uh, deliberately got into a partnership with Oklahoma State University uh, for all kinds of research, but especially like our patch burn grazing research. Who is agriculture going to listen to? So if we had, if we'd developed this whole patch burn grazing idea on our own and then tried to take it to our neighbors, to the ranching industry, um, again, we try to be practical sort of folks or, or self-aware. And uh, I guess the what we uh, were concerned about was the results would just be questionable. Well, the greenies have, you know, the green folks have developed this stuff. What does this mean? These guys aren't real science. Uh, so again, if you're trying to influence agriculture, if you're trying to influence farmers and ranchers, who do they listen to? They listen to OSU Extension. They listen to K-State Extension. Uh, those are the folks that are providing the science to agriculture. So let's, let's develop partnerships with those folks. Uh, and they, they have the expertise and, and the standing uh, to make those kind of moves in agriculture. So that's been very fruitful for us. And we've been blessed that, uh, especially at OSU, wow, we could not ask for a better team of folks to work with over there. Uh, very holistic thinking. Um, they, they have an eye towards production agriculture, but they also have an eye for conservation and, and biological diversity. They wear a lot of different hats very effectively. So, uh, and they're fun to work with. So, yeah, we're just pretty fortunate in that. that whole Sounds like it. That's been fantastic. We are blessed, right? So, uh, thank you for sharing all of that. It's very enlightening and it's incredible to see the amount of work that comes out of just this one preserve alone. So, thank you for your continued leadership over the how many years you've been. B -b 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 ben with TNC. <laughs> I got the bee stutters now. I, w I got there right after we invented grass. So it's, it's been a while. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, we sure appreciate you, Bob. Thank you so much for sharing with us today. And also thank you for all that you've, that you've done and that you continue to do uh, working with your staff and your team out there on the preserve. And many thanks to all the docents um, who also uh, lend a hand in a variety of ways to make um, certain that the preserve continues operating. And their help is also very key to us allowing the preserve to be open to the public. So just as a reminder to everyone who is on the call, the the preserve is still open, so you can go visit the bison. Um, however, our facilities there um, are not. So the gift store um, and the, the visitor center area and the restrooms are closed. So be certain to use the facilities before you come out. Be sure to fuel up um, as well, because it's quite the drive, and take some snacks and refreshments and water to be certain that you stay hydrated. Um, but the bison are there and would love for you to come out and visit. Um, we've had quite a bit of in increased traffic during this quarantine time, and so the bison have made lots of new friends um, and family so thank you all um, one quick message before we completely depart 
Um, we do have one uh, another upcoming webinar just to share with you all. We have. We will begin promotions of this webinar today, and uh, this is not until May 27th, but we have a good friend of ours. Her name is Katie Blunk. She is not a TNC staffer. She is a, a rancher in Oklahoma. So we're going to take the similar conversation, uh, but here at this time from a rancher's perspective. So Katie Blunk is out in Freedom, Oklahoma, and she's gonna talk with us about the, the efforts that her and her husband have been doing out on their ranch out in Western Oklahoma uh, to help save the monarchs. And uh, it is a cow-calf operation. So they also have grazing going on as well. So you'll hear, if you were interested in Bob's talk today, um, you might be interested in joining us for that one to hear it from a rancher's perspective. So Bob, thanks again. And uh, we appreciate everyone for joining us on this webinar series and look forward uh, to you joining us on May 27th at noon to hear from Katie Blunk. If you'd like to register for that event, registration is required you may go to our Facebook page, facebook.com slash nature.ok, where you can find the event and it will have a registration link. Or you can visit our website at nature.org slash ok events. If you don't see it, please give us a day. Um, it's in the publishing queue, so we hope that it will be live shortly. Thanks again, Bob, and thank you everyone for joining us, and we hope that you have a fabulous rest of your Wednesday. Thank you. Bye-bye.